This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Chapter 8 looks at what happens immediately after appointment, or in fact every year subsequent to appointment, uh, when you come to renew the audit, do the audit again. And this chapter will particularly deal with the first two items here, planning the audit and understanding the entity. Uh, subsequent chapters will go on to look at risk and the, the various ways in which audit evidence can be collected. However, this is the second time you have seen this diagram, and, and it's worth, you know, before we go on, just, just kind of completing the overview of the stages of the audit. So remember, it kind of started up, up, up here, uh, really before the planning stage, uh, the last chapter uh, dealt with uh, do we accept or not? So we're through that stage, we've accepted it, and now we're into planning. Uh, we'll, we will see what planning is uh, in some detail, but, but basically at the moment, if you simply remember the five P's, poor planning produces poor performance. You can't possibly do a good audit by turning up on a Monday morning, not knowing anything about the client, not thinking about where the problems might be, and expect things to work out fine. Really, part of planning and, and is on understanding the entity. They're, they're put in one after the other here, but they'll be pretty much done almost in parallel. From that planning, we will be able to identify the risky areas these are the areas where there's a relatively high risk that there's going to be a material misstatement. And we have to plan our audit so that we pick that up, so we spot these material errors. We will look at it later, but at the moment, for example, I would say that if you were dealing with a business uh, which is cash-based, perhaps a shop, uh, then one of the risky areas is, of course, cash going missing, not being accounted for properly or being stolen by the cashier, you know, one for you, one for me, one for you, and so on. Cash is a very desirable, difficult to, to trace, and it automatically begins ringing bells. This is somewhere we need to maybe spend some time. But not not every business will, will be dealing in cash. Some some businesses, the risk will be coming maybe from inventory, but more of that later. But But based on our assessment of the risk, we have to say, how are we as auditors going to face up to the risk, this, this, tackle this risk, so the chance of a material misstatement kind of getting through without us seeing it is small. And we have to change our audit approach, perhaps change the amount of testing, the amount of evidence we're going to uh, accumulate to be satisfied that the risk has been brought down to a low level. Now, broadly speaking, uh, the pathway through the audit then splits. Uh, you have some uh, companies, particularly large, well-run companies, where you expect uh, effective internal controls. Uh, this is where the uh, company's uh, accounting system is very, very well set up. Lots of reconciliations, uh, lots of people authorizing documents and uh, so on. Uh, lots of matching documents, goods received, notes matched with invoices, who so are not paying invoices that for goods we haven't received and so on here. A really very tight, tightly run company. And what happens in these types of company is that the auditor will rely on the operation of controls. The auditor will say, these controls are working well. If people are being well supervised and so on, uh, the chances of uh, an error being made and getting through and not being picked up by the company is pretty small. So what we do, is we do a test of control. Is the internal control system working? In other companies, perhaps very small companies, which uh, haven't bothered setting up a system, or perhaps just really badly run large companies, if there is no good system of internal control, then you have to rely on what are called full substantive tests. And full substantive tests really mean if if nobody in the company is uh, checking that the invoices are proper invoices and so on, if nobody in the company is doing that check, 
The only way to detect errors is if I, the auditor, do the checks. If nobody in a company is bothering with monthly bank reconciliations, the only way that we know the cash book has been properly kept is for me to do the monthly bank reconciliations and so on. So a substantive test, for the time being, we think of substantive test as being a fairly substantial number of transactions double-checked by the auditor. So just remember, it, it's not quite what substantive means, but you think substantive, substantial work. The amount of work the auditor has to do between these two um, pathways differs immensely. I remember very early on in my auditing uh, career, we uh, audited two car companies. Uh, and one was uh, an American car company. had only ever been that one company. Uh, many American companies are very, very tightly run, very good internal controls and so on. Uh, and if I, if I remember right, the, the, this large manufacturing company in, in, in the UK, but American owned, if I remember right, uh, my impression is that the, the audit fee, uh, is quite a long time ago, was, uh, let's say a hundred thousand. So if you think you are, you are here a lot, large manufacturing company, maybe four or five different factories in the UK, uh, lots of uh, suppliers and, uh, and, and so on to be worried about, many, many employees, many thousands of employees. And because the audit was capable of being done very efficiently by testing controls, the audit fee was remarkably low. At about the same time, there was uh, another car company in the UK uh, which was owned by the government. What had happened was uh, we ended up in the 60s in the UK with a lot of relatively small car companies. These were old names that some of you may recall, the things like Austin, Morris, perhaps Humber, Rover, and the like. And these were all separate companies, and none of them was really big enough to stand up to the fantastic competition that was beginning to come from Japanese manufacturers. And so what the government did was it basically nationalized these maybe six companies and kind of shoved them together into what they called British Leyland. We, we didn't worry too much about it. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore. But it was a, a an attempt by the government to give a, 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 big, a big volume, if you like, of, of production so that British Leyland could compete with the international companies like Ford and General Motors and, and the growing companies like Nissan. Roughly speaking, they sold, made and sold about the same number of cars at this point. Roughly speaking, their revenues were about the same, uh, but uh, the audit fee for British Leyland was, you know, at least five times bigger. Uh, because uh, the systems weren't integrated, the, the systems were old-fashioned, they were chaotic. Uh, they, they, I really don't think British Leyland knew how many factories it had, uh, be, because of the, the way that the, the, the systems have just been jammed together. Uh, and the, the internal control was kind of non-existent, it was really a state of chaos. Uh, and the only way you could do audits, collect evidence here, was to reproduce or do a lot of the, the kind of checking yourself that the transactions were correct. So, uh, generally speaking, you want to go down the expect effective controls. The only reason you would actually ever want to go down this here, where you're going to be looking at lots and lots of transactions, you get occasional businesses with very low volume, high value transactions. If you took a property company, which may be bought and sold 10 properties in a year, you'll probably look at all 10 of those purchase and sales transactions. It'll be relatively quick to do. There's no point really in, in, in testing the controls over those. You begin doing your tests, uh, and sometimes you find that the system of internal control, the, the signings off, the authorizations, the reconciliations that were supposed to be done weren't being done. And so what you might have to do when you get down to doing the test is to kind of change horses really and say I thought I could rely on controls but in fact I can't so I'll have to move over to the substantive tests. 
And what the auditor will do here is report to management on deficiencies in the internal control system. Either efficiencies from, from the very start, it hasn't been designed properly, or deficiencies in the way that uh, employees were not carrying out all the steps, all the controls that they were supposed to be doing. This is sometimes called a management letter, uh, where you generally set out, we'll be seeing examples later, you set out, look, here's a problem, they're not authorising overtime, and then you say, well, what could happen? People could be authorising their own overtime, you could be paying people too much. How do you stop it? Well, you get managers to authorise the timesheets, uh, and then you give that advice to clients. Even where there's good internal controls, you nevertheless do some restrictive substantive tests. You will want to do some almost direct testing of receivables and um, inventory and payables and so on. Uh, and one way or the other, what we hope to have got down here is to have collected sufficient information that there is reasonable assurance that there are no material misstatements left in the financial statements either substantially rely on the system being so watertight that errors won't happen or will be picked up by the client, you're relying on controls, or you do lots and lots of work yourself as auditor uh, to satisfy yourself that no error has kind of got through. And then we're in the position here, the final step really, is the auditor's report being issued, whether it's a, a clean audit report, an unmodified audit report, or a qualified one, except for disclaimer, adverse opinion, whatever is appropriate after we've tried to collect all this evidence. Anyway, back to planning the audit here. And if you remember back when we looked at the audit report, uh, there was a phrase in there, a line in there saying that we planned and performed the audit. We're actually telling people we planned the audit, so we have to do it. It is a, a requirement. It is an ISA. It is an international uh, uh, standard and auditing that you plan the audit because they know you can't do them otherwise, can't do them well otherwise. And what we're looking for is planning which will allow us to hit this bar, if you like, that there is reasonable assurance that we're free of material misstatement. And we can give with confidence this opinion that the financial statements are true and fair. Remember there are no guarantees, no, not every error is likely to be discovered there, we're not certifying accuracy. The only way you can really do that is if you're going to look at all of the transactions 100% and even then you may mess it up uh, because if you're looking at thousands and thousands of transactions can you maintain the concentration uh, and even if you looked at the thousands of transactions, if you didn't understand some of them, again, you, you could be uh, making errors. Anyway, planning. The purpose is to plan the audit work so we can do it in an effective uh, manner. Uh, it will go from a general strategy to a detailed approach. So we have to think, for example, in, in determining the general strategy, are we going to be maybe relying on internal controls and doing what's called a, a systems-based audit? Or are we going to be saying the internal controls are pretty useless and we're going to be doing a, a, a very full substantive audit? Those are kind of general strategies. And here we have the planning objectives. This is quite an important list. You really ought to learn this one here. Appropriate attention is uh, given to important areas. What are important areas? Well, one way of identifying is the big figures in the financial statements. So if there's a very small figure in the financial statements, by and large, the, the chance of it giving rise to a material misstatement is fairly small, though it could. Uh, but if you have a, a very large amount of inventory, a very large amount of receivables, a very large payables balance, uh, uh, something of that type, uh, then this is a big figure and a small percentage change in that big figure give it, could give a big percentage change in the profits. Other areas, uh, yeah, the, the second one you'll be looking at here, identify potential problems. Uh, one of the first things you'll look at to identify potential problems is to look at last year's audit file. 
if they had a problem, let's say, counting or valuing inventory last year, uh, the chances are they may have the same kind of a problem this year that they mess it up. So that's one, one good source of potential problems. Second good source of potential problems is you ask the finance director what sort of things have happened during the year. Uh, so if uh, during the year uh, you know, four out of six in the uh, accounting team left, that means that you've brought in four new people who are relatively unskilled, maybe at working the computer system and so on, uh, then there's a potential problem that they, they mess up. Or if you've changed your IT system, huge, huge potential of uh, messing things up. You have to transfer all the balances over from old system to new system, and they could go wrong. Uh, people are beginning to use new menu systems and, and so on, uh, and they could you know, take a couple of uh, weeks or months to, to, to get really competent with the new system. The finance director is left. Finance director is left under a bit of a cloud, even worse. Maybe they discovered a fraud part way through the year. And hopefully the finance director will come clean with you on all of these uh, and will be able to warn you a little bit about where these problems might be. Other uh, potential problems, kind of joining with this maybe a, a little bit uh, here, if you have uh, a, a shop like a jewellery shop, then you should be able to identify that inventory is a potential problem area. The inventory is high value, it is very small and portable, uh, and unless you're very skilled looking at kind of one diamond ring and another diamond ring, it can be very difficult to know which one is, is worth more. They could be easily confused and so on. So in a, a, a jewellery shop or a jewellery manufacturer, uh, there should be a lot of effort normally put in inventory. In a shop where there's a lot of cash, again, you need to put in maybe a lot of effort on making sure the cash has been handled properly. In a business with huge receivables, uh, you know the danger, the risk with huge receivables is, of course, they're never paid, uh, and even just losing you know five percent of your receivables uh, because of bad debts could turn a, what looks like a healthy profit into quite a, a nasty loss. And if there's receivables are a very big figure in the statement of financial position, you know you need to spend a lot of time there. Work uh, completed expeditiously, that in a way expeditiously means kind of pretty quickly, pretty effective. Uh, so if, let's say, the uh, client had one office in London and one office in Edinburgh, or maybe a warehouse in Edinburgh, you know, about 500 kilometres away, and you have to go up and visit uh, the warehouse in Edinburgh, you want one visit to do you. You don't want to go up one week to look at receivables and another week to look at the payables and another week to look at the inventory. You want to go up for two or three days and, and, and do the whole thing in one visit. Uh, you want to, to uh, make sure you just common sense kind of planning there. Proper staffing and work assignment. Proper staffing and work assignment. Two things there. First of all, how many staff? Again, determined to some extent by the size of the client and how many branches, factories, warehouses they have. Uh, and the second thing you have to look at is what sort of skills the staff need. In a very simple audit, you can have very junior staff doing it. Uh, in the more complicated audits, then you need you know more skilled staff. And ideally, you probably have in the audit team somebody who was there last year, knows a little bit about the client, was in a very junior capacity last year and then this year they've kind of moved up uh, a notch and maybe this year they could be in control of the audit team out at their clients but we need to make sure the proper skills are there coordination with uh, other parties uh, other parties uh, for example if you're hoping that internal audit is going to carry out some of the work we have to liaise with them sometimes you need other parties to value inventory so in maybe a jewellery uh, uh, shop, maybe you want an independent valuer to come in. Uh, if you're a property company, you may need somebody to come and value the, the various buildings that the company owns. And you have to coordinate these people to come in at the right time so that they 
know what assets are there at year end and they can produce their report in enough time to complete the audit. And finally, to facilitate review, what do we mean by uh, facilitating review? And, and let's just, let's just see. When you go to a client, let's say medium-ish sized client, uh, the chances are maybe four auditors actually go out to the client's office. So here we have the, the four auditors actually on the audit. You have three very junior people. And they're looked after there by a relatively junior person, probably unqualified. Uh, you may sometimes see reference here to a supervisor. They might sometimes be called an audit senior. Something of that sort. But that's the team that actually visits the client. And what the audit senior will do is they will assign work to themselves and to these, these junior people. Generally speaking, the most junior person will get the easiest work maybe doing bank reconciliations, cash, not much goes wrong with that. Uh, someone else with slightly more skills and so on uh, might be given receivables. Receivables can be difficult because you have to assess whether they're going to be paid or not. Uh, what they might keep for themselves is what's generally regarded as one of the hardest areas of the audit, which is inventory. How much is there? What value should we put on it? Will it sell and so on? And these people here, the very junior ones, they will perform their work and then the supervisor will review it, will look at the work they've done, look at the evidence they've found, sometimes send them back to find some more evidence or maybe even to redo the work that was unsatisfactory. This is a review process. After maybe two weeks at a client, uh, they'll come back to the office with all the audit files uh, and in the office will be an audit manager And the manager will probably sit down with the senior and will go through the audit file, looking at the work that everyone's done, uh, looking to make sure that the uh, supervisor has already reviewed the work of the more junior people and so on. And sometimes the manager will say, I need you to go back and do some more work. I need some more explanations about this figure and so on. Uh, but now we have the second review. And then uh, towards uh, the very end, uh, just about when the audit report is going to be signed, it will go to the partner. The partner is the person who's going to be signing the audit report. And generally speaking, the file goes to the partner with this audit senior. Okay, The, the partner normally wants to talk to a person who is actually at the audit and who experienced any audit problems and difficulties firsthand. And partners, in my experience, are remarkably talented at finding where there are problems. So you go in with your audit file, you know most of it's okay, but you may be a little bit worried about uh, maybe one aspect of the, the audit and, uh, and so on. Maybe you, you, know, you hadn't quite time to, to complete it, maybe you rushed it a little bit and so on. Uh, and nine times out of ten, the partner will open the audit file at the place you didn't want it to be opened. Uh, because you know, the partner's maybe being in charge of this audit for some years, remembers that inventory has always been a problem or, or, or wages have always been a problem, whatever it is. They're very, very astute. And sometimes, even at this stage, the partner will say, I don't like that figure. Uh, I need some more assurance that these receivables are actually going to be paid and so on. Uh, go back and find some more information. So now we've had three reviews going on. And hopefully by the time you had three reviews, the chance of a, a, an error kind of slipping through the net is relatively low. But you need to build in time. Time for the review process uh, and time for any uh, kind of repair process, any extra work that needs to be done. Uh, as a result of those reviews. Gaining an understanding of the entity here, uh, I'm not going to go through this in, in uh, complete uh, detail, but you, you really kind of do need to, to know what these headings are here. Uh, we obviously need to know the sort of business that the thing is in. 
there may be a regulator for that business that we have to be uh, kind of a little bit careful about. Uh, we uh, need to know what sort of accounting policies they have, maybe about uh, valuing inventory or taking profits on building contracts and uh, uh, so on. We need to know how the company assesses uh, business risks uh, because uh, yeah, the, when a company identifies a business risk, it ought to do something about it. It ought to maybe think about how we're going to control this business risk and make sure it doesn't produce any errors in the financial statements. But I'm, I'm not going to go through that in any more detail. Two more little slides just to look at uh, uh, here. Uh, first of all, it's you know how does the the audit, in terms of time, take take place? Uh, and generally speaking, maybe about the middle of the year, there is either a planning visit, usually by the manager, or at very least a planning phone call. Uh, this is where the audit manager will want to speak to the finance director, seeing if there's any problems, you know, a change in IT system, a uh, shortage of staff, a fraud, an accounting difficulty, and so on. See whether maybe during the year they acquired another subsidiary and there's a whole kind of new audit to be done. So it's a planning visit, a planning phone call. And then uh, maybe about September, there's what's called an interim audit. And this is where most of the tests of control are done. So you'd be testing our controls working really for the first nine months. Does everything seem to be operating correctly? Year end comes, and generally you have to wait a couple of weeks uh, before they have uh, finalized the uh, financial statements. They've uh, thought about accruals, prepayments, adjustments, depreciation, and so on there. Uh, and maybe third, fourth week into January, uh, the financial statements are ready. You can go in and you can do the final audit, where there's much more direct verification of the balances and amounts which are appearing in the financial statements. Last item to, to talk about uh, on um, planning, just really a reminder, materiality. At the planning stage, you will be assessing materiality. Uh, you have to tell the junior people going on the audit when they should begin noting down errors uh, for the manager and the partner to, to consider. It's the size of the error, it's the nature of the misstatement, and so on. And I will simply remind you of these kind of working percentages, if you like, which are commonly uh, expected uh, in the exam for you to, to use in the exam. is something material. And then remember that having uh, identified it in the financial statements, maybe something which is about 10% of profits is material, you say what we're also worried about is several errors which together would end up to 10% of profits even though they are each less than 10% of profits. So the actual performance materiality, the materiality to be used in the performance of the audit will often be brought down a little bit to try to trap any errors which all stack up, all add up in the same way.